गुड बाय मिस्टर चिप्स रीड एंड एंजॉय लेट्स रीड द स्टोरी अबाउट अ स्कूल टीचर हु डिवोटेड हिज होल लाइफ फॉर द बेटर फ्यूचर ऑफ हिज स्टूडेंट्स इन द मिडल ऑफ द नाइनटीन सेंचुरी देर वॉज अ वेरी प्रेस्टिजियस एकेडेमिक इंस्टीट्यूशन नोन एज ब्रुक फील्ड वेन मिस्टर चिप्स ज्वाइंड एज लैट इन टीचर There were 500 unprincipled ruffians to whom the baiting of new masters was a fine art, an exciting sport and something of a tradition. Decent little boys individually, but as a mob, just pitiless and implacable. The sudden hush as Chips took his place at the desk on the dais, the scowl he assumed to cover his nervousness, was indicative of an imminent explosion. Suddenly, someone dropped a desk lid. Quickly he must take everyone by surprise and establish his authority you there in the fifth row you with the red hair what's your name Kali sir very well Kali you have a hundred lines to write thereafter there was no trouble years later when Kali was an alderman of the city of London and a baronet and various other things he sent his son also red haired to brookfield and one fine day chip stole him colly your father was the first boy i ever punished when i came here 25 years ago he deserved it then and you deserve it now how the class laughed and how sir richard laughed when his son wrote the story in next sunday's letter chips was ingeniously funny his reprimands were gentle and there was a touch of humor in the way he presented things that quite often had the errant student laughing along with the rest of the class and again many years after that there was an even better joke for another colly had just arrived and mr chips said punctuating his remarks with a little that had by then become a habit with him colly you are a splendid example of inherited traditions i remember your grandfather he could never grasp the elements of grammar and your father Do I remember him? He used to sit at that far desk by the wall, the biggest fool of the lot. Roars of laughter from the students made Mr. Chips' classes the happiest ones and the boys loved him. Brookfield was an old institution, established in the reign of Queen Elizabeth as a grammar school, and rebuilt with large additions in the reign of George. I several notable families supported it and it supplied fair samples of the history-making men of the age. judges members of parliament colonial administrators peers and bishops mr chips had by 1880 become an inseparable part of the institution his humor was infectious and it had endeared him to legions of students till he had become a legend himself unlike other teachers he did not isolate himself from the students he liked to stroll across to the playing fields and watch the boys play He would smile and exchange a few words with them when they touched their caps to him. He made a point of getting to know all the new boys and having them to tea with him during their first term. It was usual for older students to tell new ones, "Decent old boy, Mr. Chips, gives you jolly good tea and walnut cake with pink icing." Gradually, Chips grew old with the institution and its tradition. It was in 1900 that Mr. Meldrum who had been the principal of Brookfield for 3 decades died suddenly of pneumonia in the interval before the appointment of a successor chips became acting head of brookfield there was a faint rumor that the governors might make the appointment a permanent one but chips was not really disappointed when they brought in a young man of 37 with the kind of personality that could reduce the big hall to silence by the mere lifting of an eyebrow Mr Chips was not in the running with that kind of person and he knew it the new principal was Mr Ralston those were the years etched with sharply remembered pictures Mr Chips had a row with Mr Ralston funny thing Mr Chips never took to him ambitious and efficient Ralston had admittedly raised the status of Brookfield as a school and for the first time in memory there was a long waiting list for admission he was a live wire but you had to beware of him chips served him quite willingly and loyally 
he felt himself sufficiently protected by age and seniority from the fate of other masters whom Ralston had failed to like. Then suddenly, in 1908, when he had just turned 60, came Ralston's urbane ultimatum, Mr. Chipping, have you ever thought you would like to retire? Abruptly, Mr. Chips flared up. But I don't want to retire, I don't need to consider it. In that case, things are going to be a little difficult. Difficult? Why difficult? Since you force me to use plain words, Mr. Chipping, you shall have them. For some time, you haven't been pulling your weight here. Your methods of teaching are slack and old-fashioned, your personal habits are slovenly, and you ignore my instructions in a way, which, in a younger man, I should regard as ran insubordination. It won't do, Mr. Chipping. But, Chips began in sheer bewilderment, slovenly you said. Yes, look at that dress you are wearing. I happen to know that dress of yours is a subject of continual amusement throughout the school. Chips knew it, too, but it had never seemed to him a very regrettable matter. Ralston went on, and this question of Latin pronunciation. I think I told you that I wanted the new style used, but you prefer old methods. At last Chips got something which he could tackle in his own unique, jocular vein. Well, I admit that I don't agree with the new pronunciation, a lot of nonsense, in my opinion. Making boys say Kikero at school when for the rest of their lives they'll say Cicero if they ever say it at all. And instead of Vissus him God bless my soul, you'd make them say, we kiss him. And Chips chuckled, forgetting that he was in Ralston's study and not in his own friendly form room. Well, there you are, Mr. Chipping. That's just an example of what I complain of. I aim to make Brookfield a thoroughly up-to-date school. Times are changing, whether you realize it or not. Modern parents are beginning to demand something modern. Suddenly, everything was exposed in a flash to chips. Ralston was trying to run Brookfield like a factory, a factory for turning out snob culture based on money and machines. The old gentlemanly traditions of family and broad acres were changing, as doubtless they were bound to, but instead of widening, they were being narrowed down to the single issue of a fat banking account. All this flashed through his mind in an instant of protest and indignation, but he did not say a word of it. He merely walked away. At the door he turned and said, I don't intend to resign and you can do what you like about it. Looking back upon that scene in the perspective of a quarter of a century, Chips felt sorry for Ralston. For it so chanced that a small boy had been listening outside the door during the entire conversation. He had been thrilled by it, naturally, and had told his friends. Some of these, in a surprisingly short time, had told their parents, so that very soon it was common knowledge that Ralston had insulted Chips and demanded his resignation. The amazing result was a spontaneous outburst of sympathy and partisanship such as Chips, in his wildest dreams, had never envisaged. He found, rather to his astonishment, that Ralston was thoroughly unpopular, he was feared and respected, but not liked. And in the issue of Chips, the dislike rose to a point where it conquered fear and demolished even respect. Even young masters who felt that Chips was hopelessly old-fashioned, rallied around him because they hated Ralston's slave-driving and they saw a champion in the old veteran. And one day, the chairman of the governors, Sir John Rivers, visited Brookfield, ignored Ralston, and went direct to Chips. As they walked round the deserted cricket pitches, Sir John said, Chips, old boy, sorry to hear about your row with Ralston. We want you to know that the governors are with you to a man. We don't like that fellow a great deal. Next time he throws his weight around, tell him to go to the devil. Brookfield, we know, won't be the same without you. Please don't resign. And so Chip stayed on, while Ralston left to better himself at a bigger public school. 
By now Mr. Chips was 65 when he had an attack of bronchitis which compelled him to resign. He received farewell presentations and made a speech, which was an uproarious one. There were several Latin quotations in it but the reference to the captain of the school was the most amusing one. He said that the captain was guilty of exaggeration in speaking about Chip's service to the school, but then, he comes from an exaggerating family. The entire school stood gaping at Chip's. I remember once having to thrash his father for it. Laughter was building up as everyone anticipated an anecdote in true Chip's style. I gave him one mark for a Latin translation, and he exaggerated the one into seven. Roars of laughter and tumultuous cheers. A typical Chips remark everyone thought. Chips continued, I remember lots of changes at Brookfield. I remember each and everything. In fact, I remember so much that I often think I ought to write a book. Now, tell me what should I call it? Memories of rods and lines, eh? Another bout of cheers and laughter. It was around 1933, when he had just turned 85 that Chips fell badly ill. The doctor gave him medicines to soothe his nerves. He fell into a kind of somnolence, that was partly sleep and partly wakefulness and in between state full of dreams and faces and voice, old scenes, scraps of old times, cheers and laughter and over it all, the Brookfield bells. Once he heard the doctor whispering, poor old chap, must have lived a lonely sort of life, all by himself not always by himself. He did marry, but it was only for a year or two and then she died, the attendant said. Pity, pity, he never had children, said the doctor. At that, Chips opened his eyes as wide as he could and sought to attract the attention of the speakers. I thought I heard you say I never had any children, eh? But you know I have. And then the chorus sang in his ears in final harmony, more grandly and sweetly and comfortingly than ever, Pettifer, Polly, Persons, Potts, Pullman, Purvis, Pim Wilson. Come round me now, all of you, for a last word and a joke, my boys. And soon Chips was asleep. Goodbye Mr. Chips. Greed. When we were born with no possession. The love received was our concession, no worries, no fears, no troubles, no fuss. In mother's arms we put our trust. But as we grew, we looked and craved, and all too soon became enslaved. The more we saw, the more we wanted. Our quest for more became undaunted. Our thirst for more could not be quenched. The more we grasped, the tighter we clenched. We scampered and gathered and gathered to hoard. Possessions became our master and lord. And when we are old with our treasures all heaped, a sad example of what greed has reaped. Our fists still clenched in a grasping motion, till at our death, when our hands are opened, 